So my name is Geraldine O'Reilly and I work at Clio as our UK Regional Marketing Manager. And I'm delighted to be bringing you today's session, which is the seventh installment in the How to Grow a Law Firm series. So this series has been running throughout 2022 and we will have one more session and that's on December 13th before we round it out for the year. To give you a little background on the How to Grow a Law Firm series, it's a Clio series wherein we feature firms who are growing and scaling in unique ways and finding new and inspiring ways to work. For each session, we have been featuring unique legal businesses, but we also hone in on a specific theme so that others can learn and think about their approach to growth as well and choose which levers to growth that they would like to use. For today's session, we have a bit of a blast from the past. So many of you may recall back in 2021, we ran our Making Off a Law Firm series when we followed four new law firm leaders who had all set up in 2020 during a worldwide pandemic. Four brave souls, I would say. Um, well, we have asked all four leaders to come back and join us today to discuss how year two has gone for them and the challenges, learnings and wins that they have had. First of all, we have Alistair Wells. Welcome, Alistair. So Alistair is the founder and director of Ten Legal, and Alistair is an experienced commercial solicitor. He co-founded Ten Legal with his wife, Shona, in 2020, with the aim of finding a better way to deliver amazing legal services to startups and SMEs. Alistair is known for his approachable manner, zen like calm, and clear commercial legal advice. We've also got Elena Manukian, partner at The Injury Solicitor. In 2020, after seeing that legal services could be delivered from almost anywhere, Elena decided to launch her own firm. Specializing in personal injury law and being a small firm, Elena is able to offer clients a personalized service, which you simply don't get from larger firms in the UK. Welcome, Elena. We have also got Kim Cross, partner at Vine Law. So Kim is a solicitor who initially qualified in Australia and moved to the UK in 2009. Along with co-founders Melinda Smith and Kath Collins, Kim started Vine Law in 2020 with the mission to build a firm that focuses on providing exceptional client service and is also a great place to work. And finally, our fourth leader, Natalie Foster, founder and CEO at Inspire Legal Group. As a founder and CEO, Natalie is responsible for the overall vision of Inspire Legal Group alongside a dedicated board. With a proven track record, record of growth and success in legal practice, Natalie is intent on replicating this for Inspire Legal Group. Natalie is passionate about leading forward-thinking legal professionals toward the future of legal practices. With over 20 years experience in finance, Natalie's expertise in anti-financial crime and regulatory compliance for source funds in property transactions has set her apart as a leader to implement new and evolving strategies to shape the future of the legal sector. Alistair, Elena, Kim and Natalie, thank you so much for joining us today. It is good to see all your faces and I can't wait to hear what you've been up to. So before we get into our main topic today, I want to mention a couple of housekeeping items. This session will be 60 minutes, so we'll get you out at 12. I know we started a little bit late, but we'll, we'll catch up and we'll get everybody finished by 12. We will be recording this session and we'll be sending the recording out to everyone who is registered. Um, you should get that recording tomorrow. I see there was a couple of questions there around that. We want lots of Q&A, so please do pop your questions into the chat box or you can pop it into the Q&A box either. If you use the chat function, just remember that if you select everyone in the dropdown, all attendees can see your questions and comments. We suggest doing that. It's always good to see the chat um, flowing and, and commentary coming across from, from all um, folks who are on the line. But if there is a question that you just want your panelists or, or us to see, you can select uh, host and panelist in the dropdown or pop it into the Q&A function for us. Fabulous. So a little bit more about Clio. For those of you who are joining for the very first time. So as mentioned, I work at Clio and Clio is on a mission to transform the legal experience for all. And this series is really part of that mission. Being the market leader for legal technology means that we have an added responsibility to set the tone for the next generation. 
and to help ensure that the, that the technology shaping legal experiences is also serving the greater good. So by providing a platform for our community to tell their stories of growth and innovation, we are hopeful that others will be inspired and together we'll make that mission a reality. And when it comes to what Clio does in terms of our product, well, I'll just preface this with saying that we won't be going into a lot of detail today on the Clio product, but I know a lot of folks do tend to join our webinars in the hope of learning more about the product. So what I'm going to do right now is just launch a quick poll um, for those of you who do want to hear a little bit more about Clio. Um, and just bear with me as I launch that poll. There we go. So you should be seeing it on your screen now. And whilst that poll is running, I do, I can give you a little bit of a quick synopsis um, as to what Clio is um, and what we do. So with Clio, you have two main solutions, Clio Manage, which is our core case management and practice management software. And that offers you everything you need for practice management in the cloud on any device, whether you're a Mac user or a Windows user. There's also a downloadable app for Android phones and for the iPhone. Key features with Clio Manage include time recording, unlimited document storage, e-signatures, and a client portal, um, as well as billing and, of course, matter management. Our second solution is Clio Grow, and this software helps law firms by automating that intake, the client intake element of the, of the client journey. So helping firms with that early stage of potentially of managing a potential client. With Clio Grow CRM software, you will be able to manage, engage, and retain new clients in a matter of moments. You can connect it to your website for online intake forms, or you can um, also connect it to your calendar for easy scheduling. And there's much, much more to that as well. And together, the two form what's known as Clio Suite. However, you can also um, have Clio Manage as a standalone package as well. So back to our main discussion for today, how to grow a law firm from startup to success. Starting a law firm is tough, is a, is a tough step to take in itself. Um, but there's often the sense of adrenaline, courage and scrappiness that can drive you through those first few months and year. Um, but how do you keep that momentum going and use it to scale and grow? Well, our panelists today are going to chat about this. Bear with me as I'm going to launch another quick poll because I would love to get a sense for who we have on our call. So I'm going to launch a quick poll if you could take part and if there's an answer or if so you've if you find that one of the um, the selections uh, isn't um, describing your current setup, then pop it into the chat. Um, but what we would love to know is who on the call is thinking of setting up a firm, who has set up a firm in the last year. Um, maybe it's two to five years that you set up a firm or it's over five years ago. You maybe are working at a firm and have no plans or intentions to set up set up one of your own. You don't work at a law firm, that's good to know too, um, or other. So if there's if it's a case that none of the above suggestions um, best describe your situation, pop into the chat where it is or what you feel best describes your situation. Um, it would be really good to know. It seems like we have a, quite a few people, about a quarter of the people on the call are thinking of setting up their own firm. And then we have about 20% both um, who've set up in the past year, who have also set up two to five years ago. So a lot of new firms, which would make sense given the topic that we're about to discuss. Fantastic. So we're at about 75 participation on that as well. Okay, I will close our poll. That's really helpful to know as we're talking um, in our discussion. So Alistair, Elena, Kim and Natalie, and I'm just seeing, yes, we have Natalie. There we are. Um, so what I'd like to do right now is invite you onto the call um, and I'm going to go around to each of you and just if you could give us a little bit of an overview as to why you decided to strike out on your own. I know we've probably discussed it in 2021, but there's a lot of uh, a lot of new folks on here. So um, please um, do let us know. I'm going to come first of all, Alistair, I'll come to you. Go in alphabetical order. OK, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, 
So we started 10 Legal, really the idea came about in the first lockdown. So March 2020, um, everything had gone a bit mad. Um, we were juggling sort of homeschooling our kids. I set the firm up with my wife, Shona. But, but this is when the idea came and we just we saw how possible it was to work remotely. We saw how, you know, the benefits of being able to work in a way that fits in with your family life. But also we saw this opportunity for sort of working in a, a much less formal way for the kind of businesses we like working with. So we work with a lot of startups and scaling companies, um, creative businesses. And we thought, well, what if we didn't look like a law firm or if we didn't present and act and operate like a law firm if we were more like the clients we want to work with and that kind of idea got us quite excited and then we sort of worked on it and then launched in December 2020. Fabulous and Shona is there somewhere today as well working away. <laughs> She's gone out to Lidl. Oh there you go. <laughs> That's the support I get. <laughs> Getting your lunch you'll have your lunch at 12 o'clock. Um, so who's next? E, I'm just doing my alphabet here. I'm going to go to Eleanor. I'll come to you next. It will be myself. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. So my name's Eleanor. And uh, in December 2020, I launched the Injury Solicitor, which is a personal injury law firm. So for anybody that works in personal injury in the UK, you'll know we've had some major reforms, um, which were always on the cards for, for a long time. Um, and during the pandemic, I just decided to really take my future into my own hands um, and set up a business that could work with the reforms and um, also create a bit of a life that I wanted to live. Um, a work-life balance was always sort of like a key uh, motivator or incentive for me start to start my business um which I failed at miserably <laughs> because I don't have much of a work-life balance at the moment um but I'm almost two years in and yeah love, loving every minute so far not every minute a lot of minutes so brilliant thank you Ellen and thank you for the honesty as well Kim we'll come to you next uh, hi everyone. Um, so I started buying law with with um, some colleagues in November 2020. Um, I think for for me, I'd been pretty disenchanted with the legal profession for a few years and had been contemplating leaving it entirely. Um, but the stars collided, and some opportunities mixed with um, mixed with that wish to do something new, and that's how that's how we came about. Um, and I think you know our our aim from the start was to yeah shake things up a little bit to to try and have a firm that isn't you know like trying to move the titanic when you want to do anything um mm -hmm. to be agile to be really client focused as well and and sort of break down those barriers where solicitors can tend to be a bit elitist or uncommunicative so those those i think were were what we wanted to to try and change Hopefully we've got there. <laughs> um, and we're going to touch on that a little bit later, just that change yeah. management piece and how that's going um, as, as all of your firms have, have grown. Natalie, coming to you next. Hi, everyone. Morning. Um, yeah, I'm Natalie Foster. Um, I founded a firm in 2020 in the first week of lockdown. Um, like many of us in our bedrooms on a laptop. I know we've had those conversations, guys. Um, what drove me to branch out on my own. Um, I worked in a high street law firm and having come from a, a financial background, came into legal practice and was really um, unpleasantly surprised at the way in which firms have been run and how dated some of the systems are and the processes and the support that the staff um, were getting and it wasn't limited to this one firm there was uh, this was kind of a standard attitude as, as regards to the industry um, and then everybody all of a sudden realized they needed Microsoft 365 and we all went cloud because we're all working from home and it became very uh, prominent on everybody's mind and um, so it seemed like the ideal opportunity to start fresh and offer um, lawyers both who want to be employed and who want to operate as a consultant because they don't particularly want the risk of running their own firm to practice in a more modern way. Um, and therefore, we've launched various different incentives and support 
to educate lawyers around how best to operate and to have a more profitable legal business because we don't just run a law firm, we have a legal business. Fantastic, Natalie. And that's a really yeah, interesting way that looking at it as opposed to the law firm and looking at it from a business perspective. And I think that's something that we'll probably get into a bit today about. We were talking earlier um, just before we joined around um, the, 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 the running the law or doing the law part is, is actually easy, but the business part is, is where the tough um, decisions and things come from. So um, yeah, we'll get into that uh, shortly. And um, what I'm going to do now is just uh, do, I'm trying to recap, I suppose, year one in a couple of minutes. But if you were to look back at year one and with hindsight or without hindsight, um, is there anything that you would have done mm. differently? Any lessons learned in that first year? You would lot you think other firms or other other businesses that are thinking of, of going um, or are in year one should know about um, and I'm going to open this out to to the to room yeah I'm happy to to jump in because I've had a lot of lessons that I've learned in uh, in year one and year two um, and w one of the first ones is to hire sooner um, th than I did unfortunately I got to a point where I was so busy um, that hiring just kept you know going to the bottom of the list and then I got too busy to hire and um, then when you do hire it feels a little bit rushed um, you probably wish you had a bit more time I definitely say hire before you actually need to hire which I know is very very difficult um, because of cash flow but that is a tip that I would give to any solicitor now is to look to actually hire somebody um, to do the legal work um, because before you know it your job isn't isn't to be a solicitor um, it'd be to run it, it would be to be a business owner um, and on that point as well is not to try to do everything yourself um, I feel certainly for me that I want to understand everything I want to understand every procedure how things work um, but those aren't my job so leave it to experts whether you're outsourcing whether you hire someone and um, let those people get on with those jobs so that you can concentrate on one very basic thing that you need to do and very basic skill and that's be a salesperson and get the work in for those would be nice tips. Thank you, Alan. That's a really, really good tip. Um, would anyone else like to come in? I think um, getting really clear on what it is, what what kind of work you want to do, and not doing other things is important. I think in the early days when when we started, I was probably a bit a bit too ready to say yes to to anything. Not you know things that I could do, but actually weren't our core business, and end up taking a lot of time and you know never never go as well as 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 where it's things that you you actually are set up to do well so so that's something I think I've got much better at saying no I would agree with that as well that I think that's a good tip actually mine would be to sweat the small stuff because it's very easy when you've got this exciting plan to start up a new business to you know lose sight of your budget spend things that you spend money you don't have or that ideally you should keep <laughs> for cash flow um but also um just to make sure that you don't like Eleanor said with staff like don't sit there and and analyze everything before you sign up to it but also when you do sign up to something then you know look at it in the same way that you would if you would advising a client on it I think and make sure that you just pay a little bit of attention to the details and don't get caught up in too much excitement that's what I would say Thank you. Uh, I think just piggybacking off what um, Eleanor had said about hiring it's about um, going with your gut when you meet somebody as well as to whether they're the right fit for you um, I've you know been in a position as I'm, I'm sure we all have where you've got somebody that's got an extremely strong cv you know they've got a lot of experience but perhaps that's it, it looks very impressive but then ask yourself you know why have these individuals been hopping around why can't they find a home why can't they stick in one place and and you know that, that usually I find if the work ethic and attitude as to how far someone wants to go to support your business um screams a lot more than you know where they did the training contract or whether or not 
you know they're doing extracurricular work etc so um go with your gut instinct when hiring people and then if you surround yourself with really good competent strong people delegation is just key because you cannot do everything very well you end up doing everything poorly or diluting yourself and it's it's very stressful I've heard (laughs) (laughs) thank you Natalie Uh, really yeah those are really really all four really practical tips there from everybody and um, I hope people are taking notes uh, but we are recording so if you do want to listen back you get them and um, now another question and I'm going to try and keep everyone brief on this one is there anything from year one that you've stopped doing it can be a, a simple thing or could be anything you can think of time recording for us we just oh. yeah we I mean we didn't do it all the time anyway but there were some matters we would charge on a time basis when we first started and we stopped that quite quickly and then I was still kind of recording time for a while and then I just realized actually we don't we don't need to and it's a hassle to do and so we just stopped and how has that been so was it it was probably scary at first to um in some ways it just I mean it feels like a bit of a weight off really because it's another thing that you have to do each day and and you know you don't always remember to do it and then you kind of have to think back at the end of the day and think well how long did I spend and really we've tried to move away we don't we don't charge on a time basis anymore it's all fixed fee or subscription and you know there was that question at first well do we need to isn't time our input and should we measure that to see how long and I I think there's it's a valid argument but it just didn't feel like it was enough of a reason to keep doing it for us and um, I think people are much happier not having to do that Fantastic. Thank you, Alistair. I think for me, there was there was a point where I actually started um, really concentrating on the type of cases that I was taking on um, and becoming a bit more selective um, with it being my time and taking up a lot of my time to actually run the cases themselves and with me being financially invested in the outcome of those cases. I think it became a lot more important for me to vet cases because at the beginning, you're just happy somebody wants to instruct you, right? You know, you were looking at the merits of their case. Um, and actually that that in itself is is, is an issue. So I think I, I, yeah, I started becoming a, a lot more selective, um, a lot better with clients as well in that I felt more confident in myself in selling my services definitely after the first year. But yeah, def- definitely more selective with, with the type of clients and the type of cases that I'd work with. I would say for us, it's a combination of the two of the things that Alistair and Eleanor have said. Um, we have got more confident in pricing. I think to start with, we would just take on, you know, take on anything really and then price it too low. Um, so both of those have stopped. <laughs> we Or we're getting better, should I say. <laughs> we're getting better. Um, yeah, so I think, and we'd like to get to a position where Alistair is to you know say goodbye to the um to the hourly rate but a little bit difficult I I I see Scott Simmons is on the call here and I imagine when you're talking about uh pricing his his ears are ringing so um yeah fantastic to hear that and Natalie coming to you Uh, yeah just on that um Scott's a friend of mine as well and um he does some tremendous work but Kim what you've just mentioned somebody um a solicitor who um was not of the attitude that you should be selective as to who you represent or work for, um, was trying to negotiate or coming down in price, which would have been ridiculous, would have been working for free. Uh, oh, but hang on a minute, if we don't price it at this, we're going to lose all this work. And I was like, but then we can do two other clients at more of a cost who will value what they do. So we're not losing out because we don't have a shortage of work. And it was like, oh yeah, okay. So, you know, just ra- that realization that sometimes the best thing you can do is to say no. Um, but just going back to your question, Geraldine, for us, it was, um, it, if you have the unique um, opportunity to start as you mean to go on, get your processes right, get your operations and your systems and your processes. Um, particularly if you do property work and there's you know high level of risk in terms of AML um, obviously we know that's hugely on the um, on the SRA's mind right now just get your policies and your systems in place and 
I'm always happy to talk to any either managing partner or someone who's wanting to launch about how we managed to do that and get everything so it was flowing um, because it's very hard once you start to then go back and fill those gaps it needs to be in there from the beginning. So just on that I know for each of you technology was a big piece and technology goes hand in hand with processes and that was a big piece when you were starting out your firm is it so Natalie you're saying it is just as important now I suppose as it was um back when you started it up um can can you talk about any of those kind of maybe new systems new processes that you had to or implement I suppose in in year two transitioning kind of net to more yeah um I mean for us it you know onboarding remote workers as well is really key supervision of those remote workers so making sure and, and Cleo does support with that because it allows us to track activity literally every single move that's made on the case management system I can see um like some of you know some of the smaller firms we have like uh, we outsource services so we outsource the legal cashiering that doesn't remove your liability in respect of that so you need to monitor that um again clear supports with that which is really helpful um i think it's difficult to say one particular process and system that everybody should utilize because every practice is different and every client everyone's client base is different for us it was really important to nail down litigation and the, the court process and the diary and the property work and the AML and how our search provider links in and collaborates with that. So APIs are really important um, and, you know, wanting to offer our clients the ability to identify using their mobile phones, facial scanning, things like that. Um, you still need to be able to offer that access to justice though and that service to people who don't want to open a laptop and don't want to use a smartphone so it, it can sometimes be tricky because it has to be inclusive um but we've you know we're, we're trying to educate clients and lawyers as well as to best practice and it's it's moving in the right direction thank you natalie I'm seeing a good few questions coming in and comments and things here as well. So one that's come in and it's probably taking a step back to something that was touched on, I think, briefly. But when it comes to attracting clients and um, so in year one versus now, um, how are you taking are you all taking the same approaches to before? How many of you have had to were able to bring in clients and bring over maybe a book of clients when you started? And um, any thoughts there on, on when it comes to attracting new clients? I can take this if you want. We, um, we had people follow us. We didn't sort of actively, you know, poach anyone, but people knew we'd left and people are still finding us, um, you know, on a... Um, you know specifically looking for us but we also focus on um social media we know um that people are finding us just organically through google now which is which has been great i would say though that the most work that we get comes from um connections that we have with other small businesses and um from uh, other professionals that we know so accountants that we that we know we we meet up with and just having formal chats with all the time and we sort of take care of each other and refer to each other and that really strong network is where the majority of our work comes from yeah I, I feel like in year two attracting clients isn't this mad scramble for clients you're not um you know it's when you start and you, and you have a handful of clients and you're just worried and you think nobody will ever instruct me again I think it gets slightly easier into year two um not much easier um but I feel like a lot of newer clients are actually coming to me because they've been referred by my previous clients which which is a real testament really and, and that's something to be proud of um and social media social media is still there it's still a massive um sort of draw in terms of getting those clients in um website google is just not something that i've even got around to um to to, to updating or implementing or putting a strategy in for um i think that's really year year freeze problem um but it's actually very nice when you do get current clients or 
previous clients recommending you to to your new future potential clients and I think it gets a little bit easier because you've got that pipeline of work to then not have to stress about it so much but also what's important to say is that we're all relatively small-ish businesses in comparison to, to other businesses and I think that where it's difficult is when, when you want to grow a business um, or when you identify that you want to grow your business, those tactics, while they whilst they work when you're a small business, they might not necessarily work when you have 10 or 15 employees that you then need to support. So then that's a whole new pivot that you would probably have to take. Um, but that's something that I think I'll, I'll worry about in year three. <laughs> there's, um, I know there's something in, in um, Jack Newton's book which is another Clio plug, but um, he, he talks about the flywheel of, and you kind of get momentum going for the firm. And obviously it's, it's every part of the business um, aimed at moving this, getting this flywheel going. So your marketing, your delivery, you know, if you're, if you're attracting the right people, you're doing a great job for them. They then tell more people, they leave reviews. And there is that, that kind of sense of, of gaining momentum, I think, which is really good. And, and, you know it's different for different types of firms I mean for us we're we're fortunate in that we tend to well one of the things we offer is an ongoing legal support service so once we acquire a client as long as we do a good job they'll stay with us it's not like we're constantly having to find new work um and then those people hopefully will tell other people and and I think that's something I can I can start to see happening I can see that momentum and it does it's like the others have said I mean it does I think it gets easier for that reason the longer you're out there the more people know about you and will recommend other people fantastic I think all of it even just hearing you all speak this morning that the confidence as well there's a level of confidence you've confidence in in the work that you're doing um and your firms and your approach and everything and that's really coming across today and I think that's potentially a big shift like you did have confidence last year but the shift is is amazing to see um, so lots and lots and lots of questions coming in here. Um, I'm going to switch focus to, to hiring and switching back again. So we have someone here, Armin, who's seeking to hire in the new year. Um, they're a sole practitioner. Who would you recommend as your first hire? Should it be a law student, a virtual assistant, a clerk, paralegal, a lawyer? Um, what, what could each of you maybe talk to your first hire? Yeah, um, I, I had my first hire in, in year two. And the first thing that I would recommend doing is identifying um, where you need most help with. Right, So um, I actually outsourced a lot. I outsourced my legal cashier and I had an accountant. Um, I have a company who answer my phones. So if I had a call in now, there'd be a company that would answer that and they would send me an email saying, you know, this individual called, can you call back on this number? Um, I outsourced as much as I could to avoid hiring somebody. Um, and then it got to the point where actually it was unavoidable. <laughs> And it was a little bit boring and lonely. So um, I hired a legal assistant because I identified that I was spending a lot of tasks on quite admin related things on files, like chasing medical records or chasing clients up. And I identified that that was taking a lot of my time. So I hired a legal assistant. However, the next hire naturally would be to progress to hire a solicitor to do some of the more in-depth legal work to free me up to go and do business development I think it's about identifying where you need the most help with if you cannot outsource that outsourcing will cost you a fraction of what it would to employ someone if you can't outsource someone or you actually want a person there that is dedicated to your business identify what you're spending your time on and can your time be spent better elsewhere i.e making you more money or making your business more money that would be my tip Thank you, Elena. Has anyone gone a different route and hired somebody else as their first first hire? Um, I've had various different hires, um, but it's it's predominantly been like forward facing, like Elena says. I mean, we have our consultant um lawyers and we have some employed lawyers as well. Um, they range from licensed conveyances to solicitors. But a lot of our people, our core people, uh, are legal assistants and paralegals. Um, and they have the ability, obviously, to support in generating the income for the business. But what they also do is they come with um, the ability and the want to shape and mold into what the culture is in your business. So they don't have like a pre um, requisite idea as to what it's going to be working for a firm or any particular firm they're not hugely institutionalized I find so 
you know, we have, for example, we have an ex-medical secretary who is working in our clinical negligence department. Um, she's phenomenal because she her skill set isn't legal, but she understands duty of care and she's able to adopt the the kind of the limitation situation and, and for the department. So think outside the box with hiring. Don't always go for the generic, you know, training contract LPC. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but there are um, there are a great benefit to looking at other skill sets coming into a law firm. Um, one of our reception team um, worked for O2 and was phenomenal at dealing with complaints and challenging behavior and time scales. And I want a refund and not that we get one of those, but you know what I'm saying? Um, all of that sort of stuff. And it's, it's phenomenal to watch her work. Um, I mean, I've, you know, having worked in, in legal now for about eight years, she's, she can bat anything off, nothing stresses her out. Um, so when hiring, just look look at the breadth of skill rather than the depth of skill as well, because you can always, somebody put in this chat and it was a great, great thing to say, you can teach skill, but you can't teach attitude. So, um, yeah. Thank you, Nazi, and I hope she's listening in, actually. That's a, a nice little layer. Uh... She's not. She's in Egypt on holiday. I'm really quite annoyed at the moment. <laughs> Kim, I'd like to come to you just on that hiring piece because you've recently hired a, a legal technician. Could you explain? Yeah, we have. I was just going to say, say, talk about her. Um, she's been with us for a while, actually, but she likes to hide. <laughs> so she's just come out of the shadows. Um, yeah, so we were... I mean, again, like the instinct is to hire an assistant or receptionist or a secretary or something like that. Um, and that, you know, that is helpful. But rather than doing that, we um, hired what you might have been in-house IT, but she does something different to that, which is not necessarily looks after our IT because we have an external um, company that deals with that for us but what what our, our legal technician does for us is to instead of typing one letter and then that goes away and we never see it again and that goes in the post what she does is helps us to set up precedents and help us automate as much of our documents as we can whether that's precedent letters or contracts um, and to do them in a way that um it, it auto fills and they auto create as much as possible. So for example, if I was doing a shareholders agreement, then I would say to her, look, I've just done a shareholders agreement. This is what I want to use as a base. Then she will put it into Clio for us with all of the um, custom fields automatically filling so that in the future, if I want to do uh, the next time I do a shareholders agreement, then I can just enter some details and it will automatically fill for me. Um, it doesn't mean that it stays like that, but it gives me, it takes you know time off that I can then look at making it bespoke in the way that I need to. Um, so so that's that's a lot of the stuff that she does for us. She looks after our website as well and does some marketing and bits and pieces like that. But a lot of it is trying to um, you know, stop us doing repeated, like repeating work where we've done it once. Yeah, makes sense. So she's really great. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. Br br being uh, working smart, I would say. That's um, it. Yeah. I've, so quite a lot of surprisingly, um, not surprised because when we ran this series last year, it was a lot of marketing questions coming in. So there's a, quite a few coming here. So I'm gonna I'm gonna switch over to marketing for the moment. You mentioned that that um your legal technician um does a bit of marketing and you have it done in house. Is there any? Do you outsource anything or is it all kind of done in house for you, Kim? We initially we initially had a, a, um, a lady that did our social media to start with. She was also wonderful, um, but we got to a point where because we were taking on a legal technician, we thought we can do we can do some of this in house. Um, and so she she does a lot of our social media for us now. Make sure that we you know write articles, make sure that those go on the website, so that we're changing the content all the time because that's the other part of of you know google rankings and however those things work don't ask me but um the, the constant change to the to the website has been important um for that yeah and just to keep that that social presence known so we know for example i was talking to a partner this morning who keeps an eye on the analytics and apparently our audience on social media is mainly female between the ages of 
30 and 55 or something like this so we know that the the, the type of social media posts we make ought to be targeted to those people because that's our audience really interesting that's fantastic mm -hmm. natalie i'm gonna come to you you went through a rebrand so could you talk a little bit about that and how marketing how, how long did it take who did you work with and yeah there. sure yeah um so the we actually undertook a name change, but the, the brand has stayed very similar and the color palette and everything was very similar because that ultimately wasn't something I felt we needed to change. And um, it still reflected the personality of the firm. Um, it was really important moving forward. And, and this is again, something that, you know, if you wanted to talk about something that I'd have changed in year one, we were really un like non-creative with our name and we just stuck our surnames on it and with my um, founding partner at the time and it got to a stage where it just felt more than us it wasn't about ego or about us being you know having our name and I think not that there's anything wrong with that but there was there was no value to it um, it wasn't as though we were inheriting, you know, like a, a firm that had been around for 100 years and there was goodwill in respect to that name. So um, I wanted it to be an autonomous name, something that was neutral, that didn't name anyone, but just delivered a message quite short and sharp. And the idea behind that was, you know, we, our clients aren't just clients, our clients are lawyers as well. We market to lawyers to join our movement, to join our firm and work with us. Um, well, how do you attract um, senior, qualified, intelligent people who may or may not have already been a partner or wish to be a partner? You know, these are ambitious people who want to run departments and teams of their own. Do they necessarily want to be seen to be working for a firm whereby their name is probably never going to be on the front of it? So if we just neutralized it and took that out of the mix, it has nothing to do with ego and it has nothing to do with this is my firm and my business card's got my name on it. It's to do with the mission and what we're doing and what the business. Um, you know, the fact that as, as we grow, it, you know, that our, our business plan is to grow strategically and to incorporate other smaller firms that have specialist departments. Well, if they've built up a brand of their own, why do they want to be bringing that in with someone where there's an existing name? So it was strategic in that it it didn't it was to try to include and not alienate anybody who deemed themselves to be you know have their own personal brand um, and didn't want that extinguishing by somebody else's name um, and it's worked well and and we've you know we've got a few things in the pipeline as a result which I do genuinely believe wouldn't be the case if we still had my surname slapped on it because it becomes about an individual not about the firm That's it is interesting actually Geraldine that we've all now got um all of our firms have yeah. names that aren't, aren't so we've got 10 to buy and personal address you know that so they um I think it's also a symbol of of modernization in itself definitely I was even yeah. just thinking Natalie as you were talking there that you weren't just thinking about your clients and who are marketing to the clients. How do I get the clients in? You're thinking about your your brand, your hiring brand, your culture, your all of that. And that's really, and I was going to say, it's really inspirational and it is inspired little group. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it, it is because, but it's not, we're not reinventing the wheel. You know, we are in business at the end of the day. Um, why are we doing all of this? Why have we put ourselves at personal risk? Why do we have conversations about PII that make us want to cry? And, you know, all these things, uh, it's got to be for a reason. And, you know, Eleanor's point about work-life balance, you know, that not that I think when you've worked for yourself, how could you go back to working for someone? I personally now couldn't. Um, I would if I had to, hopefully that's not going to be the case, but, but, Everything, everything you've got you, you, is about your brand. It's basically, it's your set of accounts and it's your brand. And, you know, one of them is very tangible and it's numerical and it's, it's, it's evidence of this is how well you were doing. And another one, uh, you know, people haven't quite cottoned on so much, although it is getting there and that has value. It has goodwill. It has audience. Um, but equally, it's a very exposing place to be because something goes wrong 
and it's attached to said brand and all of a sudden that can have a really negative impact so you know treating people properly and making sure you consider how complaints are handled and and aligning yourself with decent people and if if you make a mistake which everybody does at some point it's just owning it and fixing it because again as you hire and pull people into your baby your brand it's a risk mm. Um, and I think, yeah, just the, the reputation is still so, so important within the legal industry specifically. i um, going to touch on something now that we was brought up very early, but um, making changes and making changes in year two versus year one. And um, each of you me mentioned during our prep call that with year two, implementing change and has, changes has been tougher. And um, maybe that's because there's more people to consider and there's more clients that are in there now. Um, and I was wondering if you have thoughts on how or if you have efforts that you've made to try and stay nimble and agile. Um, I'm going to open it out to, to everybody. Like, are you are you noticing that making changes is is tougher? Alistair, maybe coming to you on that. Yeah, I, th I think it is. You know, the more people you have involved in your business, then inevitably the, the the more you have to consider when you make a decision about it. I think there's different there's different ways of of, of going with this. Aren't you? you get some people take a very dictatorial approach and say, well, like we need someone who can make fast decisions. This is what we're going to do, and everyone has to jump in line. I think you you know that can be difficult for people working for you. I think we tend to attend we tend to take a bit more of a, a sort of consultative approach so we we know that we have to make decisions but at the same time that the people who are involved in those decisions and affected by those decisions need to be consulted so we'll generally we'll have an idea we'll talk it through with people who it will affect and then we'll make a decision um it's not a democracy but but we do have to take everyone's everyone's view into account um and that you know it does it does it's a lot more work than when there were two of us and we'd say should we do this yeah okay let's do it um but i think it's it's a good way of of doing things and people have to feel that they're part of that journey with you and if, and they are you know inevitably if we're introducing a new system the people that are using it need to need to feel that their voice is heard and that they have a say in it thank you alistair yeah, I think when when there's change involved, like what um I think maybe what somebody who is employed in a business maybe doesn't appreciate as much is that change change is uncomfortable for us as managers or as business owners. In fact, more so um yeah. because there's actually a lot riding on that. And for for us to prove that what we're trying to implement is what we feel is the right thing for the business, we have to think of the people within the business and the business itself as well, which are actually two very separate things. Um, change is uncomfortable for, for everybody involved. Um, I think the most important thing is when a change isn't going the way you planned it to go or isn't having the impact that you'd hope, that you can recognize that quickly and actually do something about that so you don't break that or lose lose any trust in that process. And ultimately, if it is for the better and it does turn out the way you hope it to turn out that that builds trust in itself so next time you do go to implement a change it becomes a, a little bit easier um but i think a lot of it is trial and error in a lot of ways but i think recognizing if it's an error um and doing something about it is is the key yeah, yeah. one thing that we we try here a lot um at clio is retro so if if we do a change or make a change we do a retro um or if we work on a big project we do a retro to see what it was that went wrong what went right so we can then learn from that for the next one so we're not repeating the same thing mistakes over and over but um yeah so i don't know if that's helpful to folks but uh it's doing very interesting a retro step so we've got a few minutes left um and i would like to spend the next few minutes talking about what's next so what's coming up in year three and beyond for each of your firms if you can tell us that is um, and what I'll do is I'll go again by alphabet. I'll go in the non the opposite route. Um, Natalie, I'll come to you first. What's oh, coming? That's not fair. I'm definitely not first. Um, <laughs> what's next? Well, um, we have a an announcement in the next four weeks, um, which we unfortunately can't disclose presently, um, but. 
moving forward, similar growth in terms of partnering with either A, firms whereby they have a viable business, but the managing partner or partners are exhausted, need some sort of um, 2022 kicker, they need some support, they need some help because you know everyone talks about supporting the lawyers, but you know, we we crack up sometimes. We need we need some help, and it's not always in the form of you know a bottle of wine in the fridge. It's like actual tangible help. Again, you know, not to um, pick single somebody out, but you know, someone like Scott Simmons, um, that kind of support. Michelle Peters. There's some really great coaches out there that can support people in running their business. But for me, um, and for the board at the moment, it's looking at. Um, strategic acquisitions of these firms and key people who can launch departments. The objective being that we remove the red tape from these people and we allow them to focus on what they do well, which is practicing law, taking care of the clients and generating income. And if they, you know, as a smaller firm, you're, you've got all of the same risk and all of the same procedures. Um, so if we can take that away and work in partnership um, and that's a really key word. Um, just recently recruited um, quite a, a high profile clinical negligence solicitor who has her own brand. It was really important that that wasn't extinguished. So we always say we're working with this person. They're not working for us, they're working with us. So that's, we're just going to keep doing that and make good decisions. Fantastic. Thank you, Natalie. I'll be watching, I'll be watching the headlines next four weeks. <laughs> Uh, Kim, come to you next. Um, so we will be hiring um, uh, um, Fiona or whatever you want to call them. Sister. Um, uh, we're not entirely sure in what in what in what role at the minute because there's we could take a whole bunch actually. <laughs> so we'll have to think about that. We're working on a subscription um, service like Alice's. So we're just tidying up the last few bits on that so we can get that going. Um, and I think if we can just uh, continue to grow, that's really what we what we want to do at the minute. No massive ambitions other than, you know, to keep that, that turnover going in the right direction. Um, we had a really good I mentioned in our in our pre-discussion that our turnover grew in our second year by 140%. So if we can do that again, <laughs> uh, that would be amazing. So we'll see. Fantastic. Phenomenal. Yeah. Eleanor, I'll come to you next. Yeah. So for me, it's much of the same, really. It's it's about growth. But I've been quite small for a long time. Um, and that's an uncomfortable change for me to be looking at hiring um, paralegals, qualified solicitors uh, to come on board, um, expanding where I get my work from, taking on a lot more work, um, hopefully running some Google campaigns, which I haven't really done before. Um, social media as well. I want to really concentrate on growing the business and growing any solicitors that come on board, growing their personal brands, um, growing personal brands of those people that are, are in my team and actually really utilizing that because I think that's an untapped market in itself and I think that in year three that's something that I do want to concentrate on um, because I think that will help with business development growth I know we haven't touched on office space um, it's a it's a bit of a taboo topic right office space whether you get an office space whether you don't so I have gone back to working in an office um, almost five days a week um, and I love it it's just it's it's it's, it's where I work best and um, so an office is in the pipeline and yeah growth and hopefully survival in the in the PI market which is a miracle in itself but there we go somebody's just said Elena about you going back on LinkedIn it's felt really lonely without you oh. on it. <laughs> it's really nice to see you back in the game definitely thank you I yeah anybody that knows me knows I'm I'm a huge advocate of LinkedIn it's um it's changed my life um and I don't say that lightly and I think that it has the potential to change anybody's lives and, and in fact we've all been brought together really through through um the power of LinkedIn and I took some time away just because of how busy things were and it's difficult and you get writer's block and to, to think of um of content and then to engage in it afterwards as well can can be difficult but if you're not you know anybody for anybody on the set seminar that 
doesn't use LinkedIn, I would highly recommend it. Um, it, it has some some amazing opportunities with, within that platform. Um, but yeah, I'm glad to be back on there. <laughs> Fantastic. And for anyone who hasn't seen it, pop over to Elena or to Alistair or Kim Natalie's LinkedIn profiles. They're they're always posting fantastic content. And um, Alistair, coming to you. Yeah. So for the for the coming year, we've got we've actually just hired two people who are starting in March, which is really exciting. Um, I think one of them might be on the call, but I probably can't say who she is. But anyway, um, um yeah so we're really looking forward to that we uh, other than that it's 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 going to be more of the same we want to build out the subscription offering a bit more doing some work on our systems internally um we've got an idea for a new a new offering that we're going to we're going to roll out at some point um but yeah so so a combination of 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 new things and and more of the same really Fantastic. Um, yeah, another one to keep an eye on for this excitement, exciting announcement. Uh, brilliant. Um, lots to come for everyone. So if you don't already follow Elena, Kim, Alistair and Natalie, please do. And you'll be able to keep up to date on what they're what they're about to announce. Um, we're almost there. So I'm just going to round out our session. Um, as mentioned, we have one more installment in this year's How to Grow a Law Firm series. On December 13th, we'll be joined by noted law firm service providers, including Chris O'Day from The Cash Room, who provide outsourced legal cashiering and compliance services, legal virtual assistant Kelly Simpson, and legal marketing service provider and expert Rachel Toombs from Orion Legal Marketing. Um, so I know marketing was touched on quite a lot, so um, worth heading along to that session, asking some questions of Rachel on that. My colleague Regina will share a link for that session in the chat. Um, and I also want to mention another resource that we do have that actually, Alistair, you helped out a lot with on this one, um, which is our How to Start a Law Firm Guide. So if you found this in session interesting and have been thinking of starting your own firm or just started one, this resource can help with information on everything you need to consider with starting um, or setting up a firm. Um, and again, it's a free resource and uh, Regina will share that code. I think she already has and that link. You can also scan the code. And then because we love things that come in threes, uh, I also wanted to mention that if you have been if you've missed the, the previous episodes in this series, you can catch them all on our website. We have all of the webinars recorded. And um, so again, you can scan that QR code or click the link in the chat and you'll be able to catch up on the previous six episodes. This was our seventh. And finally, just a sincere thank you to Alistair, Elena, Kim and Natalie for joining us and again, sharing their stories with us and what they've been up to. You've all been really inspirational leaders to so many of the new generation of law firms coming out, and you should be very proud of the fact um, that you've done that. I'd also like to mention a very quick thank you to Regina O'Shaughnessy from Clio, who's been helping out in the chat. Um, and finally, thank you to everyone for joining us today. The life of a lawyer and business owner is a busy one. So taking the time out for key learnings and webinars like this is not only essential, but it is really appreciated. Until next time, have a lovely day and we'll see you again. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.